Uh, good morning. This is uh, Dr. Aligam Shaker. Uh, I welcome you to the uh, Fellowship Diploma in Lateral Scale Based Surgery 2019. Uh, and I'm uh, Professor Aligam uh, Shaker from the University of Washington School of Medicine, Departmental Neurological Surgery. And I'm going to be speaking to you uh, today about vertebral artery anatomy and surgery at the foramen magnum. Uh, some of the uh, slides I'm going to go through uh, fairly quickly, and I hope that you will have time to review them in, at your leisure. Uh, now, I'm going to speak first about the general features of vertebral artery anatomy. Uh, the vertebral artery, uh, that it's paired, there is right and left. Uh, there are four segments which are recognized, and there are branches. So the right and left vertebral arteries arise uh, from the subclavian artery, proximal to the uh, tidocervical artery. You can see that that's uh, uh, the first branch of the uh, subclavian artery. Uh, however, as you'll see, sometimes the left vertebral artery may have a direct origin from the arch of the aorta. And uh, there are four uh, segments that are recognized. So the the first division is from the origin of the artery from the subclavian to its entrance point in the C6 intervertebral foramen. That's that there. And in and, uh, and this slide, this uh, rare uh, specimen, which we uh, recognize very commonly angiographically, is a situation where the left vertebral artery has a direct origin from the arch of the aorta. Of course, uh, if you do uh, a, an injection uh, in the arch and uh, do a roadmap, then you'll recognize that. So the, um, uh, the artery is, uh, as you can see here, posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then it's posterior to the uh, internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery, and uh, the, it's also posterior to the subclavian vein. And uh, uh, it is accompanied by uh, two veins, two vertebral veins that are anterior and posterior. And uh, also, uh, you'll see that uh, there is the uh, first uh, ganglion, that is the sympathetic ganglion. Um, uh, the stellate ganglion is uh, lying very close to it. And on the left side, uh, it is crossed by the, um, the lymphatic duct. You can see that here. Uh, so these are all uh, important uh, when you're working on this uh, segment. The second uh, segment uh, is from uh, the artery lies within the transverse foramen from C6 uh, all the way to C1, transverse foramen. Um, uh, and uh, it has, uh, it becomes very important uh, especially when you're doing surgery on the cervical spine, anterior cervical discectomy, various types of cervical body dissections, uh, fusions, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, in these uh, anatomical uh, dissections, uh, beautiful sections from Dr. Paolini and Lanzino, uh, you can see the relationship of the nerve roots uh, seen from the anterior surface to the uh, vertebral artery here, these are the nerve roots. And then you can also uh, see on the left side, the vertebral bodies have been removed, uh, the, the nerve roots and the ganglia of the nerve roots. They very, have a very close relationship. The vertebral artery uh, gives rise to several uh, radiculomedullary branches. So these are supplying both the uh, nerve root, uh, there may be branches going to the meninges, and also they connect with both the anterior and posterior spinal artery. So uh, those will be constituted by branches of the uh, vertebral artery. So um, these slides uh, show how um, the, uh, this artery can be exposed from the uh, anterior aspect uh, we have to uh, divide the longest coli, longest capitis muscle, and it's just lateral to the longest coli. Here lies the vertebral body, so the longest coli and the longest capitis, and just posterior to that, 
then lies the intervertebral foramen. And it can be exposed uh, from the anterior aspect. Of course, you can uh, expose it from the lateral aspect and from the posterior aspect, as long as you know the anatomy. And uh, these slides, once again, show the uh, radiculomedullary branches, which, of course, supply both the meninges and the, um, um, and the spinal cord. Uh, in these very nice uh, dissections that were performed uh, under the direction of Professor Goel, uh, you see the, uh, the terminal V2 segment as it approaches uh, the uh, foramen of uh, C1. And uh, this is a view from the transoral approach. So when you're doing a transoral approach, if you go laterally, you'll find the vertebral arteries. Generally, we don't want to do this. The reason being that in, inside the mouth, you have all these uh, very virulent bacteria. And then once you open the, uh, uh, the uh, pharynx and go inside, these bacteria will be implanted on the artery. And this can sometimes result in a, um, arteritis and massive hemorrhage. This happened to me once many years ago in a patient of mine. Uh, everything went well, but then uh, at the end, about two days later, the patient was in the ICU, had a massive hemorrhage uh, and died. So uh, this is something that you need to be aware of, but generally do not want to expose the vertebral artery by an anterior or transoral approach. Now, the, the third segment, which is very critical for a lot of our skull base uh, dissections and skull base uh, surgery, is a segment that uh, is arising uh, from the, uh, the C1 uh, vertebral foramen. Then it runs posterior. You can see here the occipital condyle and also the, the lateral mass of C1. And then it, it penetrates this uh, atlanto-occipital membrane, which is sometimes uh, ossified. And then finally, it, it uh, penetrates the dura mater. Once it penetrates it, it becomes a V4 segment. And of course, this entire segment is uh, covered with periosteum and a venous plexus. That's uh, called the vertebral venous plexus, uh, which of course will bleed. Now, if you look from a posterior aspect, the, the terminal V2 segment that is between the, the second and the first foramina is crossed posteriorly by the second cervical nerve root. And this is an important landmark. And here it's also, you're seeing the muscles of the suboccipital triangle, which come into play when we are trying to expose the artery. Now, these are disse beautiful dissections from uh, Professor Al Roten and his uh, colleagues at the University of Florida. I don't want to describe them. I I'd like for you to just uh, look at them for a little while and understand the anatomy. Again, here, uh, different dissections uh, showing the V2 and V3 segments and uh, of the artery. The V4 segment uh, is from the dual entrance point to the vertebral basal junction. And uh, the artery, of course, has uh, different branches, anterior spinal artery, which is formed by the union of two vessels uh, from uh, the two vertebrals, their posterior spinal arteries, the inferior spinal artery, posterior inferior uh, cerebellar artery, uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, uh, and then the two vertebrals uh, unite to form the basilar, the radicular medicular medullary branches, and then there are muscular branches. So here you see the V3 and then the V4 segments. Here's an anterior spinal which in this case being formed by predominantly from the one side. And this is a normal anatomical variant. And this is the pica. There may also be some small branches which are perforating branches going to the brainstem. And uh, sometimes pica has an extradural origin, extracranial or extradural origin, which can be as low as C2. Uh, these are all variants that one needs to recognize before you operate on a patient. And here uh, in the V3 segment, you see a prominent uh, muscular branch. And again, uh, more dissections. And this is a view from an endoscopic approach. And these are, of course, uh, microscopic uh, views. Now, there are several pathologies of the vertebral artery that have interest to the skull base and cerebrovascular surgeon. Of course, you have Vascular diseases, both vertebral artery stenosis and occlusion. 
So Clavin Steele syndrome. Then we'll talk a little bit about bow hunter syndrome. Uh, vascular compression syndromes of cranial nerve 11, uh, 7, and the brainstem. Uh, dissections uh, of the vertebral artery, which can be spontaneous and traumatic, including uh, dissections induced by uh, chiropractic uh, neck manipulation. <clears throat> Arteriovenous fistulas, uh, fusiform and saccular aneurysms, uh, tumors involving the area of the foramen magnum, uh, and then iatrogenic injuries to the vertebral artery, which uh, may occur during cervical spine surgery uh, or cervical tumor surgery. And how do we study <coughs> the vertebral artery? Of course, <coughs> uh, the, the least invasive ways are um, the duplex Doppler ultrasound and transcranial Doppler. You also have computed uh, tomographic angiography or CTA, uh, magnetic resonance imaging and angiography. And then finally, intraarterial digital subtraction angiography is the most uh, uh, the definitive way of uh, studying the artery. Uh, endovascular treatments uh, of the artery may become necessary, um, especially in vascular problems, but also for tumor embolization or for embolization of AV fistulas. And uh, the surgery uh, involving the artery uh, it can be done for a variety of conditions. Uh, of course, the vertebral artery is very long and uh, the different segments uh, we can perform surgery. The first uh, segment, V1, um, the surgery is commonly performed when there is a severe stenosis of the vertebral artery. And uh, the most common uh, uh, an easier treatment is uh, placement of stent. However, when you have bilateral stenosis, the chances that the stent is going to stay open uh, are not very good in the long term. So uh, still, surgery could be preferred. And there are various ways of dealing with it. One is uh, vertebral transposition, or you can also do a short vein graft from the common carotid to the vertebral artery. And finally, you can also do a vein or arterial graft from the external carotid to the V2 segment, so further out distally, because you may have patients in whom the vertebral artery is proximally occluded, but then reconstitutes uh, distally. And uh, then, of course, we are going to talk about uh, the, uh, the lesions at the foramen magnum and uh, decompression, etc. Um, so this um, slides show the steps involved in the exposure of the V1 segment. Typically, we make an uh, incision that is uh, horizontal and slightly vertical. Uh, we commonly divide the clavicular uh, attachment of the sternomastoid muscle, which can then be reattached. And then we will start to work posterior to the sternomastoid, but then moving lateral to the, the uh, internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery on the vagus nerve to come uh, to the vertebral uh, foramen in this area. Of course, you have the sympathetics and the scalene muscles. And uh, these slides just show the uh, steps uh, in sequence. And uh, here you see the, <coughs> the, uh, the artery exposed. And uh, this is the terminal segment uh, arising from the subclavian artery that we'd like to de expose. And uh, this is a, um, a three dimensional reconstruction using the stealth station. So this can also be done if you have uh, this available. And uh, in the CTA, you see again the approach to the artery. Now, the uh, uh, we talked a little bit about exposing the, uh, the V2 segment during various types of uh, cervical spine surgery. I'm not going to go into details of that. I'm going to focus a little bit on the uh, exposure of the terminal V2 and V3 segments and the V4 segment, uh, predominantly using the various kinds of far lateral approach. There are different kinds of far lateral 
approaches, which then progress to the extreme lateral approach. And there are different variations of the extreme lateral approach, which we have defined over the years. So the question is, why do you need a lateral approach rather than a posterior approach? The reason is that it's much easier to expose the entire vertebral artery from a lateral approach. And there are a variety of lesions which you prefer to uh, come from the side because the lesion is actually over there. So instead of coming from the back, you like to come from the side. And you can do this. And, and why do you prefer this to an anterior approach? Because you don't go through a contaminated space. You have wide exposure and you don't have usually the problem of CSF leak, meningitis, et cetera. The, the key here is that you really need to understand the anatomy of the suboccipital muscles. Neurosurgeons in particular, uh, they are the worst people in this regard because throughout their residency, they've been, uh, they've been taught to just slash the muscles and cut them with uh, Bowie. So um, the, there is an irreverence, uh, disrespect to the muscle layers. Uh, but you know, when we work in the cadaver lab, I really try to teach them and reorient them. It's much easier when you're a resident than you're an attending because the attendings, they just can't get this concept. Why, why do we need to do that? Uh, but you'll see that the, the patient ceiling is much better. Uh, and also you can more easily define the anatomy if you follow the muscle layers. And of course, if you have pathology in that area, like a tumor, it becomes even more difficult. So this slide shows the uh, various types of evolution of the extreme lateral approach from the, uh, the uh, far lateral approaches. And uh, the extreme lateral approach has different uh, kinds of approaches. So we have the retrochondral approach, the partial transchondral approach, then you have the transfacetal, transtubercular, complete transchondral, transjugular, et cetera. Patients are generally uh, um, uh, under anesthesia with total intravenous anesthesia. Cranial nerves are being monitored, SSCPs and MEPs. And they're generally placed in the lateral position, although you can also do the operations with the patient in the supine position. But when you put them in the supine position, the neck and C1 rotate on C2, so that stretches the, uh, the artery considerably. So what are the muscle layers? So there are actually four layers of muscles. The first layer is the sternomastoid. And the second layer is this, uh, the splenius capitis and the semispinalis. And the third layer consists of the longissimus capitis and the longissimus cervicalis. And then the fourth layer are the suboccipital, uh, form the suboccipital triangle. So you have the superior oblique, inferior oblique, the rectus capitis major and minor. And uh, uh, the suboccipital triangle is, is lies right here. And of course you have the C1 root. Uh, remember that this is a purely motor root, only uh, has no sensory uh, function, but it uh, does supply uh, sensation. I'm sorry, it does supply the muscles uh, in this area. These two slides uh, show you what happens to the vertebral artery. Why did God give us our evolution, whatever you like? Why did we have this long uh, V2 segment, uh, terminal V2 segment? So between this foramen and this foramen, because we rotate the neck back and forth, that region of the artery has to be supple. So there are different kinds of incisions we can make. Uh, you can make a, an inverted U-shaped incision, but I prefer this type of incision, which is C-shaped. And the skin flap is reflected with the sternomastoid muscle, and that improves the vascularity of the skin. Then the next one is the spinous capitis, and the semispinalis capitis just a little deeper, and right in between la, runs the occipital artery. So if you need the occipital artery for a bypass, this is a place where you can find it because it comes out of the digastric groove and then goes in this area. So the second and the third layer are the semispinalis. The second and third layer is semispinalis capitis, the longissimus capitis. 
and uh, then uh, you can identify the mastoid tip and the C1 uh, transverse process. And at this stage, you may also encounter the venous plexus. The fourth layer are the suboccipital triangle muscles. And uh, once you reflect them from the lateral mass, then you'll see the, the V2 segment of the vertebral artery can be also recognized, rather the V3 segment, V2 is here, uh, recognized by the venous plexus. And the terminal V2 segment is crossed by the, the second nerve root, second root. Therefore, these are important landmarks here to recognize the artery. And if you have venous bleeding, this can be controlled with a bipolar cautery or fibrin glue, inject fibrin glue. Uh, and of course, you can do a, a suboccipital craniotomy and craniectomy. Normally, we just need to expose the age of the sigmoid sinus. And here's a condylar emissary vein. And just deep to the emissary vein will lie the hypoglossal uh, nerve in its extradural course. And the occipital condyle is right here and C1 lateral mass is right here. So this tells you the tricks of uh, finding the vertebral artery, how to find the terminal uh, uh, segment, and uh, also how to find it superior to C1. You can also use micro Doppler and uh, nav neuro navigation in case of altered anatomy. And uh, then finally, if you want to transpose the vertebral artery, uh, what you need to do is to completely open up the foramen of C1 and then liberate it from the C2 area and transpose it medially. This will then allow you a very lateral exposure, which brings you right in front of the brainstem, and you'll see that later on. So these are again cadaveric dissections on the left side. You can see here the C2 root. And here the, the artery has been transposed. And now we are looking directly anterior to the spinal middle junction. And you can see the anterior spinal artery. And you're seeing the contralateral vertebral artery uh, on the other side. And you can go all the way to the contralateral hypoglossal and C1 nerves. And, uh, and the dural closure normally is affected using a dural graft. Uh, this is another dissection on the left side. Uh, these are nice uh, cadaver dissections that you could do. And again, the, you could see the vertebral artery on the contralateral side. So further steps, suboccipital craniotomy, craniectomy, partial mastoidectomy, uh, and, uh, and so on. And I mentioned here that when you close, normally we close with a durograft. Sometimes we suture to the adventitia of the vertebral artery with uh, fine sutures if needed. And the muscles are put back as physiologically as possible. And uh, you may need to perform a small cranioplasty if you lost a lot of uh, bone. What are potential complications? Obviously, vertebral artery injury is the, uh, is the one that you really want to avoid. So all of the, the dissection of the vertebral artery will be done uh, under the microscope, much better, rather than doing it with loops. And uh, if you don't recognize the anatomy, you can't just go walk into the operating room and say, I'm gonna start doing this. You need to work on cadavers uh, and do cadaveric dissections, at least 10 uh, cadavers you should do before you do this on humans. Of course, uh, damage to the sinus or jugular bulb brain stem or spinal cord, cranial nerves, uh, various things uh, listed, potential complications. Now, the transpacetal approach is when you have a lesion lower down that's in front of C1, C2, and what you could do is just remove portion of the facet, not the entire facet, as you see here, the move the vertebral artery, and then you can go right in front of the uh, cord and this is an example of a patient uh, who has a tumor, you can see uh, directly anterior to C1 um, and C2. And that's, you can see here, we are very, very lateral and the tumor is directly exposed and we can debulk the tumor and uh, remove it, as you see here. The trans-tubercular approach uh, implies that we are gonna be removing the jugular tubercle. So that's a little higher because that tubercle is hiding 
the, the V4 segment as it crosses across. So here's the jugular tubercle, the lower cranial nerves. Now I like to do this using the sonopet ultrasonic bone curette rather than a, a spinning drill, even a diamond drill because of all these cranial nerves. And when you remove that, and that can be done interdurally as well. This is almost similar to anterior clinodectomy. If you do it interdurally as well, then you have a better view. You can see the difference between here and here, where you can have a better view. Uh, this is a patient with an aneurysm that uh, was visualized that way. Uh, here's an example of a patient with a fusiform aneurysm of the vertebral artery, you can see. And we'll see the videos in a minute. And uh, what we'll see here is, of course, the exposure of the aneurysm and the uh, um, so we are opening the, uh, the skin. I'm gonna uh, get through some aspects of the video fairly fast because the video is long. So, so yeah, here we are dissecting the muscle layers. Drilling. So now we are opening the dura. You can see the uh, spinal cord, spinal medullary junction. This is the 11th root, the spinal 11th root. And then see uh, the, you'll also see the uh, first dentate ligament, which will be cauterized and divided. That's what we're doing here. First dentate ligament. So there is the aneurysm, vertebral aneurysm, you can see that. And uh, it's a fusiform uh, aneurysm. That's the 10th uh, uh, cranial nerve fascicles. This is not dentate ligament, 10th nerve. So you can see that the aneurysm is fusiform. And uh, the question is whether to clip reconstruct versus uh, resection and bypass, et cetera. So we're trying different uh, things, but we're first trying to dissect the aneurysm. So that's a distal vertebral, and we put a clip proximally as well. So proximal and distal clips, and emptying the aneurysm. And what I'm doing now is a clip reconstruction. Those, uh, that's a fenestrated clip. And uh, toward the end, we take off the proximal clip. And then we're using the micro Doppler and also endocyanin green angiography to verify the flow through the uh, annua, the uh, vertebral artery. This is the postoperative CTA that shows the uh, aneurysm. Uh, here's another patient with a vertebral artery dissecting aneurysm, a patient presenting with a, a stroke. And uh, you can see the lateral middle infarct. He had a vertebral dissecting aneurysm, but uh, the problem is that uh, pica is almost isolated. You can see that the pica, which is a dominant pica, is almost isolated. Uh, so he was in another hospital and then he was sent to us. And uh, what we had to do, because the pica is isolated, we need to do a bypass to the pica, the vertebral artery. He has uh, another one from the other side. So the other side is okay. Here's the left vertebral artery, it's okay. So what we did was um, bypass from the terminal vertebral artery to pica. You can see here's the radial artery graph, and this is the pica. And we're creating an enterocyte anastomosis. And uh, there we are, suturing first the one side. And then the other side. 
So and then we bring it uh, out and we have, uh, we're gonna connect it to the radial artery and then we're permanently occluding the, the aneurysm, the uh, dissecting aneurysm. And here's the artery now. So, um, so we are going to connect it to the, uh, here's a vertebral artery in the C, in the V3 segment. So here's the artery coming out of the C1 foramen and uh, we have uh, attached it connecting and asymosing the, so here's the radial artery graph, and that's the vertebral artery. And uh, we're just closing the dura here, and this is the graph, the end of the graph procedure. So basically, in this case, <clears throat> here's a graph completed. And this is kind of the, the schematic of what it looks like, the Doppler flow. And uh, postoperatively, you could see that the radial artery graph is now filling the pica here uh, completely. And this is a three-dimensional angiography. The patient had a um, pre-existing cranial nerve paralysis. So this uh, required some time, but he, he recovered from that. Um, this is a patient with uh, uh, the navy malformation at the uh, spinal medullary junction. So this is a patient who presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see the hemorrhage in front of the brainstem. And here's an AVM supplied by the anterior spinal artery. So the AVM is right here. So there's no way to access this uh, from posteriorly. So we have to come either um, from an anterior approach, which as I explained to you before, is not suitable, uh, or from a lateral approach, you can see the AVM from the side, as well as the vertebral artery. So this is kind of the schematic here. This is uh, uh, coming from this side here, uh, from the left side, and you can see here the AVM. This is three-dimensional video, so maybe just focus on the left screen. So you need uh, 3D glasses, but if you just focus on the left screen, so you can see that, um, Here's the cerebellum, and uh, here we are opening the dura pretty far laterally. Here's the vertebral artery, so we're going to be opening the dura pretty far laterally, and you see that the subarachnoid space uh, is filled with blood from uh, previously. And uh, there is the vertebral artery coming out, and here we are removing uh, much of the clot. So we have to trace the the uh, artery and then the anterior spinal and then find the AVM. So here is the anterior spinal artery. I'm actually putting a temporary clip on it and it's going to be an end facade vessel. So here's the vertebral artery, you see that? So I'm working right uh, by the vertebral artery. The spinal cord, spinal middle junction is right here. So that's the uh, anterior spinal vein here, arterialized vein. That's the anterior spinal artery. And there's some branches going to the AVM, which is right here. So, and uh, here we are just cauterizing the branch that goes to the AVM. And uh, we're going to come around the AVM. Uh, here is uh, the blood clot, uh, the AVM, and uh, that's the that's part of the AV malformation. You can see that there, right there. So we are going to just come around it, uh, like you do with any other AV malformation, and uh, we will then excise it. And uh, here we have it uh, cauterized, and this is the vein, which is now completely cauterized. And uh, you can see the AVM spinal cord here. So nicely seen, this is the vein is turned blue in color because it's uh, no longer arterialized. And uh, that's a branch going to the AVM. 
again. And uh, pottery entry spinal, you could see that. So this is one of the branches you could see going right through the AVM, that branch. So we're going to take that. This is the entry spinal. We're going to preserve that. And uh, here's the vertebral artery. So, and we can see all the way across to the other side. See that? So, when you're working on AVMs, you need to work under low power of the bi my bipolar so that it doesn't stick and it also cauterizes better. And uh, terminal portion of the AVM resection. And uh, the AVM being removed here. Yeah. So, and uh, complete removal of the AVM. And this patient uh, had a right hemiparesis with a an anterior middle infarction, you can see that, but he recovered uh, completely uh, from this and he went home and he was seen back in follow up. And you can see the post operative angiogram showing no uh, residual area. Now, when you are talking about uh, tumors and vascular lesions, you have uh, intradural foramen magnum lesions. Uh, meningiomas uh, form a large group. This is a, a series from 2005, 2017. Uh, doesn't include the patients I've operated before. And the vascular lesions here, and then uh, vascular tumors, which are hemangioblastoma. Then you have extradural tumors as well. These are just intradural. So foramen magnum meningioma, what's the advantage of an extreme lateral approach? You can not only see the tumor, but also the dural base. So most of it can be removed, particularly if the tumor is directly anterior to the spinal medulla junction, this approach is more useful. <clears throat> so this is a Bruno and George uh, classification. They, they named uh, tumors as posterior. This is extremely rare. Um, Posterolateral or lateral and then anterior. Uh, and then also, uh, relation to the vertebral artery above, below, or on both sides of the artery and encasing the artery. Now, the way I look at it is the, uh, the uh, several categories. Superior, inferior extension. Is it mainly above the frame magnum, at the frame magnum, the C2, or below the frame magnum? Uh, is it lateral, anterolateral, or anterior? The consistency, uh, which should be soft very rarely, Firm and fibrous are calcified. The size of the tumor, uh, high vascularity, which usually means a WHO grade two tumor, or uh, three rarely. Uh, any encasement of the vessels, uh, especially the pica or anterior spinal artery or perforators. And then what about cranial nerves? Both cranial nerves, uh, 12 involved is a very difficult situation. Again, involvement of lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11, can be very difficult for the patient. Uh, arachnoid plane can be present or absent, absent based on prior surgery or radiation therapy, usually. So, um, what about angiography and embolization? It's not needed for small tumors, but for larger tumors, if it can be done very safely, uh, definitely we do it. We also look at the size and dominance of the vertebral artery, the pica, anterior spinal artery, et cetera. What about the venous system? Uh, etc. All these things. Now here's a, a patient with, uh, 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 I would say, predominantly anterior tumor, and the artery is encased here. So that's uh, two things. The patient has not been operated previously. The tumor is about two thirds above the level of the frame magnum. Uh, in this patient, we actually did embolization, uh, external carotid branches primarily uh, was embolized. So we use the um, extreme lateral partial transcondylar approach in a case like this. We remove about one third to one half of the condyle and, and the lateral mass. So that's what you see here. This is a left-sided operation as you see in this drawing. And uh, we're using Sonopet to remove the condyle and the, la the uh, lateral mass of C1. This is the uh, dura mater, it's been opened. And you can see the tumor, and the brainstem is posterior to the tumor. So we are coming laterally. So we're actually coming in front. We don't need to put any retraction, manipulation of the brainstem, et cetera. Here we're using Sonopet, ultrasonic bone curette, 
uh, removing uh, tumor, what I like to do is, if possible, core it towards the base and then disconnect it from its base, devascularize it, and then remove it. So in this case, uh, then here's the vertebral artery. You can see that's the vertebral artery integrally. That's the origin of the pica. And now I'm working uh, above the frame magnum, and that's a, the 11th cranial nerve. And I had to leave a little bit of tumor around the 9th and 10th cranial nerves in this patient to avoid any uh, problems of swallowing, et cetera. And then we treated that with radio surgery. But uh, in this case, I'm also doing intradural resection of the jugular tubercle. You can see that. And uh, we are uh, still the tumor is uh, rather bloody, and uh, we are looking, going to look across. Uh, and frequently, I will use the endoscope during these operations to look in, see if there's any residual tumor, or sometimes even uh, remove the tumor under the endoscope. So that's uh, kind of near the end. And uh, we just are going to close the dura with a dura graft. And uh, this patient, uh, um, so here's the post-operative. Uh, and the patient has a uh, uh, complete had a complete recovery, although she had a uh, transient paralysis. Uh, all of the tumor has been removed in this patient, uh, and very tiny bit left behind. Um, this is a, a different case. A patient is a recurrent tumor, so this is a, a can be a very difficult problem. This patient has a, a grade two or a grade three meningioma. And I'm showing you here, one tumor here, one here, and one here. Why I'm showing you this case is that, well, here is a vascularity and embolization. The, tumor, the patient has come to us with multiple incisions from before. So he's uh, highly set up and a lot of muscle atrophy really set up for uh, non-healing. So in a case like this, we need to involve the plastic surgeon. So in this case, we uh, ask them to place a trapezius flap at the end of the operation. They're already ready. And uh, here we can see that uh, this is the artery, uh, as you can see here, it's a right-sided operation. This has been unroofed through the C1 foramen. And, uh, and I'm using diamond drill to remove the the uh, condyle and also the C1 lateral mass. And uh, here we open the dura all around the artery and the artery can be displaced now posteriorly. This is the advantage of uh, transposition of the artery. Now the artery can displace it laterally or, or uh, posteriorly. Now we're opening the dura mater. The video, by the way, has been speeded up a little bit. And uh, we are now looking, uh, you see, this is a very vascular uh, tumor. And that uh, tells you right away that this, is, um, uh, this patient has an aggressive meningioma. But uh, the point here is that uh, we want to remove the tumor gross totally if possible, uh, which has been done now. And you see, this is the intradural vertebral artery. This is the extradural portion. And uh, these are the uh, hypoglossal rootlets. And uh, what we're doing here is right, we're actually closing. We, I opened with a dural sleeve around the artery. So we're closing that. And then we'll use a graft to close the rest, on top of which we'll use the trapezius muscle flap. So we, are, we, are, we finished it, but we actually put a patch to close. And then at the end, we put a trapezius muscle patch this patient did well from the operation. Here's a trapezius flap. You can see that they rotated the flap so that it's a vascularized flap in place. Uh, but uh, in the long term, he didn't do well because it was a malignant uh, tumor, essentially. This is a post-operative view, uh, which looks pretty good. Very rarely, the vertebral artery can be damaged during a tumor operation. Now, if it's a non-dominant artery, uh, very small in size, it may not be necessary to do any reconstruction. But if it's equal in size or a dominant artery, it's better to perform a reconstruction. This is a case 
of such re reconstruction. Uh, this is a patient with a redo operation. So this is a patient who's been previously operated and the vertebral artery was uh, invaded uh, and no heart, heart plane. So I removed the tumor and I had to repair it using a saphenous vein graft and a short segment of the artery itself. And, and the patient did quite well from this. Uh, now, more medially, there are patients who have uh, giant-sized uh, vascular tumor. So this is a patient with a large medullary and cervical cord hemangioblastoma. So this is a patient with progressive hemiparesis for six months and in, not in very good functional shape. And uh, you can see it's a multi-cystic and uh, it's hard to say where is the spinal cord here and uh, where is the tumor. And uh, this is a gentleman who was working for Intel, very high level professional. And you can see that this is invading right into the cord. So pretty large tumor. So a case like this, it's uh, we, we actually a branch of anterior spinal artery and the lateral spinal artery both supplying. So a little bit of embolization could be done to the lateral spinal artery. And uh, you could see here, anterior spinal and lateral spinal, both supplying this tumor. And uh, again, uh, this is a case where we didn't need extreme lateral approach, but we did a far lateral approach, uh, as you can see here, and then C1 uh, to C partial C3 laminectomy. And uh, we were able to, so here we have done uh, all of this stuff and uh, we are just opening the, and, and you can see that I put a temporary clip on the vessel feeding the tumor, which is actually in the uh, uh, medulla and the spinal cord. And uh, then gradually uh, working to free up the tumor. Uh, just like any, any other hemangioblastoma, you need to control the arterial supply first. And then once you do that, you can come around it just like an AVM. And uh, here's a normal cord and uh, tumor is of course invading into the, uh, into the cord, but there is a peel plane, you see that. So I'm just, and also there's a cyst, which is helpful. And uh, toward the end, I got the whole tumor dissected here. That's the anterior spinal artery, by the way. And uh, so that's a little bit up here. And I'm just, uh, Cauterizing all of that. And here the uh, tumor uh, coming out uh, completely. Uh, the reason I want to show you this is that this is uh, not extreme lateral approach, but a far lateral approach combined with a uh, hemilaminectomy and a very lateral approach. And it gives you a very good exposure. This is the ICG at the end, which shows that the tumor has been completely removed. And uh, postoperatively, he has a complete resection. And uh, he, has, he went back to work, and I saw him uh, afterwards. His follow up is no tumor occurrence at all. Now, uh, to speak a little bit about vertebral artery decompression and PEXI for macrovascular decompression of the brainstem and the lower cranial nerve. So, we have a number of patients that have um, either compression by the vertebral artery. Uh, of the lower cranial nerve seven and eight, or uh, the brain stem patients presenting with hemiparesis, in which case we have to do something. So this is such a case of patient with a hemifacial spasm, but we have to- This is a patient with a hemifacial spasm on the left side, caused by a compression uh, by the vertebral artery and the anterior inferior cerebral artery. This was a 73-year-old man who presented with uh, disabling uh, hemifacial spasm for four years. He uh, had uh, Botox injection, uh, which uh, did not succeed. Uh, so the operation uh, was performed to perform a decompression of the seventh uh, cranial nerve. Here we you can see here the, um, the vertebral artery, it's compressing the brainstem. 
And uh, you can also see on the axial view that uh, the artery is here, severely compressing and distorting the brainstem. So in a case like this, it's not enough just to put Teflon padding. You can see that uh, compression of the nerve. So you have to actually move the artery and hold it away. So what I do in such cases, I do a procedure called PEXI. So PEXI means we mobilize the artery, make sure that the perforators are intact, and then we suture it. I put a couple of stitches, usually eight or nylon, through the media, and then suture it to the clival dura and hold it in place as such. In this case, it's interesting also, the AICA has a very long extradural or uh, uh, course. So uh, the AICA is actually going extradurally, so we had to dissect it so that we do not damage it. So that's the extradural dissection of the AICA. So that's what we're doing here. So that's completely dissected. Now you see the, uh, the uh, vertebral artery in the depth. Here are seventh and eighth nerves. In a minute, you'll see. So that's the eighth nerve there. We're just opening the arachnoid. And uh, we'll use not only the microscope, but also the endoscope to visualize the uh, deep portion. So that's the vertebral artery and that's ICA. They're both compressing the root exit zone of the seventh nerve. So, uh, and we look at it uh, now with the uh, endoscope, which will give us a very nice view of that. Yeah, there we are. Look, we are mobilizing the arteries, two arteries, the vertebral artery and the ICA more away. And we're suturing the vertebral artery to the uh, clivus dura. So that's what we're doing here. And the assistant has to kind of hold the artery up so that when we tie the sutures, it'll stay in place. So we'll put a couple of stitches. And uh, of course the lateral spread, which is uh, an important uh, evoke potential to monitor during these operations disappeared. Yeah. Finally, we're also mobilizing the ICA and putting some cotton pad and uh, Teflon padding there to make sure that the ICA is not up against the, the brainstem. So we're, we're putting that. Uh, so, uh, and this is just, and in this case, what happened, the, um, the auditory brain response went down because this internal auditory artery is in severe stretch. So I dissected the arachnoid and I put some padding to elevate the artery so that it's no longer under a stretch. You could see that. So that was done. And the BSCR recovered. And postoperatively, the patient did very well without any recurrence of the hemifacial spasm. And I want to show you the MRI. And uh, in just a second, the MRI shows that uh, the... Uh, We don't see it here, but the MRI showed that the artery is well decompressed and this patient had a complete uh, recovery. Then to talk a little bit about Bowhunter syndrome. What's a Bowhunter syndrome? When the patient turns their neck to one side or another side or looks up, they can develop uh, symptoms of posterior fossa uh, ischemia. That's a Bowhunter syndrome. So the that this is the mechanism of such. Basically, when you turn the, the head, there's rotation and kinking. The kinking can be in a variety of places. It can be at C2, C1 foramen. It can be at the, uh, an ossified uh, ligament. All of these can be. Um, and this is a patient with uh, Bowhunter syndrome. And it's, uh, again, a three-dimensional video. So uh, this is the patient when uh, 50 years old, whenever he turned his head to the right, he began to the right. So you can see that preoperative CTA demonstrates, uh, demonstrated, and also an angiography, 
he has a complete occlusion when he turns his head to one side. So basically, what we do here is a complete decompression all the way from C2 uh, to, uh, through C1. Here, this is just showing uh, dissection of the various muscles, etc. And uh, is a C1 posterior arch being dissected? And uh, C1 transverse foramen is being unroofed. And uh, in a case like this, you have to do, uh, you have to find the various points of compression, and that can be more than one. Otherwise, the patient will not have relief of symptoms. So the transverse foramen is being unroofed, and uh, the uh, so this is just, we're just applying some fibrin glue for hemostasis. So that C1 uh, transverse, uh, I'm sorry, lamina with the sulcus arteriosus there. Here's the artery. And uh, so we are going to remove all of this. That's just a muscular branch that's being divided. And then here we're working around C2 to completely decompress the artery, so that the artery, uh, we need to decompress. So that's a C2 nerve root, which was also compressing the, the uh, um, artery there. So we uh, did a, decom a section of that in this case. And here now the artery is uh, pulled up, and uh, you can see we're going to decompress it all the way to the uh, dural entrance point. And uh, then I'm, what I'm doing is to really thin out the, uh, the lamina, the lateral portion of the lamina. And you see that the vertebral artery is now in a new position. That's the C2 root, and it's in a new position. And I'm cutting the ligament that is binding it to C, C1. So it's fully mobilized uh, vertebral artery. Postoperative CT angiogram shows a uh, good flow. And uh, he was completely uh, asymptomatic. Finally, we're going to talk about complete transcondylar push. This is mainly used for extensive chordoma. So we talked about partial transcondylar approach, but we can also remove the condyle and the lateral mass completely when the tumor is invading that area. And uh, that will bring us to the midline. Here's the odontoid process. These are cadaveric sections and lower clivus, and then at the end, we have to do some kind of a fusion. So here's a uh, young patient with a very severe and very large uh, chordoma. You can see foramen magnum, lower clival area. So we had to, you can see that tumor here and going out on both sides uh, along C1. And we had to, I did the operation in uh, three stages here. This is now, first, the surgery from the right side. So that's a C2 root. The vertebral artery is completely encased by the tumor. And I'm dissecting the tumor away. And uh, here's the artery. That's the artery there, the vertebral artery. And uh, I'm tracing the artery to the dural entrance point and uh, removing all the tumor and a lot of tumor there we could remove and that's this anterior to the uh, spinal medulla junction. Here you can see the C2 root and the vertebral artery both on the right side. And we're using the sonopet ultrasonic bone curette to remove any bone that looks abnormal. So after this operation, she had uh, some residual uh, tumor. Um, and, uh, and what we did was we actually did a posterior fusion here, as you can see, uh, occiput to uh, C23. And then we did a similar operation from the other side. So this is a similar operation from the left side. 
bilateral transcaudal approach because she had the half of the tumor remaining. And it's a very almost identical to the operation on the right. And uh, ultimately, the, this is what the MRI looks like. There is a small uh, piece of residual tumor here, uh, retropharyngeally uh, near C2. Uh, nevertheless, we gave the patient um, uh, proton beam radiation. We also placed a bone graft for the replacement of the occipital corneal and the lateral mass. And she healed up very nicely. And now she's been followed for more than 10 years without any recurrence. So I think I'm going to stop here uh, because it's been a long uh, day. Uh, and uh, what I want to summarize here in this presentation, first of all, uh, to recognize the anatomy of the vertebral artery and its four segments. The, um, the first segment of the artery is primarily in the purview of the endovascular and the cerebrovascular so open, so open cerebrovascular surgeon. The second segment comes into play when you're performing spinal surgery, either tumors or ACDF or trauma or whatever, you may have to deal with it, or iatrogenic injuries as well, and dissections, and sometimes uh, AV fistulas. Now the third and the fourth um, uh, parts of the vertebral artery are in particular involved in tumors and aneurysms, and rarely, of course, AVMs, but aneurysms and tumors in that area. And it's very important to know how to expose the artery by using a lateral approach and how to deal with it and how to use it to your advantage. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Thank you very much for your attention. And goodbye from Seattle.